Hello. In this tutorial, we're going to introduce you to Abacus CAE, get you familiarized with the interface of Abacus, and give you a general idea of how to perform a basic finite element analysis in Abacus. Now, we're going to accomplish this using an example. We're going to simulate the loading of a barbell stand with a barbell, just like the ones you see in a gym. Now, barbells can be pretty heavy, so if you were designing a barbell stand, you want to make sure it's strong enough to bear the weight of the barbell. And one way to do that is to analyze it in Abacus. On the monitor behind me, you see a 3D model of a barbell. Let's take a closer look at that. The setup consists of two stands holding up a barbell, each bearing an equal share of the weight. We're going to use the dimensions from this schematic. We'll be using SI units, where length is in meters. The stand is a solid block made of steel with a density of 7.8 grams per centimeter cube, a Young's modulus of 200 gigapascals, and a Poisson's ratio of 0.3. When performing finite element simulations, it is not necessary to model every single part of your simulation. Engineers often decide what needs to be part of a simulation and what doesn't, in order to save time and computational resources. We do not need both barbell stands in the analysis. We can just use one and assume it carries half the weight of the barbell. To simplify the simulation further, we don't model the barbell at all, but replace it with a force equal to its weight. Here you see a depiction of the barbell stand with loads and constraints applied. A force equal to half the weight of the barbell will be applied in the U-shaped clamp where the barbell will sit. The base of the barbell stand, which is normally in contact with the ground, will be fixed in space using an encast or boundary condition, meaning that it cannot translate along the X, Y, or Z axes, nor can it rotate about them. So let's go into Abacus and give this a try. Now, if you haven't already done this, the first thing you want to do is go to File, click on New Model Database, and choose Standard Explicit Model. You know, the other option is a CFD model. CFD is Computational Fluid Dynamics. Uh, we are not dealing with fluids in this model, so we're going to go with uh, the first one. Now, there's two kinds of models. You know, it said standard slash explicit. A standard model is where you're simulating uh, forces and loads acting on an object that's in some sort of equilibrium. Whereas in a dynamic analysis, you might have, say, an object falling off a table and you want to study how it breaks apart. So you've got a sort of impulsive loading going on there. And you might also be interested in the transient behavior of this object under loading. So you might want to see the stress distribution and the object change over time. And for that, you'd use an explicit analysis. But in our case, we're going with a simple standard static analysis. Now what you see over here on the left is the model database. The model database essentially consists of different models. And each model is made up of different modules, such as the parts, materials, sections, and so on. So when you create a simulation, you put it inside of a model. And this model contains all of the information Abacus needs to run the simulation. Information which you, of course, provide to Abacus. It's possible to create multiple models within one model database. This could come in handy if maybe You've gone ahead and populated this model, set up all the aspects of the simulation, and then you think to yourself, what if I want to just change one aspect of this? Well, maybe you could go right-click on the model and choose Copy Model. And if you did that, you would find another model appearing here in this tree. If I minimize that, you'd see Model 1 and then Model 2 after that. And then you could make 
a small change to that model and run that simulation. Abacus, by default, names the model Model 1. We can go ahead and give it a more descriptive name. Not so much because we need one over here, but because I want you to see how you can rename a model. So you move your mouse over Model 1 and right click on it and you can choose rename. And so we're gonna give it a slightly more descriptive name. I'm gonna call it the Barbell Stand Model and I will click on OK. And there you see the model's been renamed to Barbell Stand Model. The first module we're gonna take a look at is the Parts module. This is where you create the 3D geometry of the part. Now, if you've worked with CAD softwares in the past, such as CATIA or SOLIDWORKS, you have a general idea of how you create a part in CAD. In some ways, Abacus is similar to other softwares, but it also has other differences. Because when you're creating a part here, you also have to specify what kind of analysis you're really going to be doing on it. So we'll go ahead and double click on parts and there you see the create part window. We're going to name our part barbell stand. In the modeling space we're going to choose 3D because this is a three-dimensional object that we're modeling. If you were maybe doing a two-dimensional analysis where you've only got an X and Y axes, you don't have depth. Uh, this could be with maybe a sort of planar shell analysis, or maybe you're just modeling a 2D truss. Or you could, in fact, be modeling our barbell stand, but only from a 2D perspective. In that case, you'd go with 2D planar. But we're going to go with 3D. In the type, we're going to choose deformable because our barbell is essentially a deformable body. Now, it's going to be a very strong body because it's made of steel, but even steel is deformable. So we want to specify that in the type. The third category here is the base feature. You've got solids, shells, wires, and points, and we're going to go with solid. You might go with shell if maybe you're modeling the exterior fuselage of an airplane, which is basically the tube in which people sit in an airplane. And you might go with wire if if you're doing a truss analysis and you're modeling each of the elements of the truss as wires and using truss elements along them. But we'll, we'll get into that stuff later. For this simulation or this tutorial, let's go with solid and the type we're going to choose is extrusion. Now uh, you've probably heard that word before if you've dealt with any CAD softwares. An extrusion is where you create a sort of sketch and then add depth to it to create a three-dimensional object. You could have gone with revolution or sweep. A revolution would be useful if maybe you were creating a body like a disk. But in our case, uh, we're going to go with extrusion and you'll see how it's done in the next step. The approximate size essentially tells Abacus, or rather gives it a general idea of how big your object's going to be, how big your part is going to be. So it initially sets you up on a graph paper that's about the right size so that you don't have to zoom in or zoom out too far. So this is not too important. It's more of a user convenience feature. So I'm going to say 5 because our barbell is about 1.5 meters high. So I want to be in that same order of magnitude. And I'm going to click continue. What you see now is the sketcher window. This is a 2D sketcher interface. And I can use the scroll wheel on my mouse to zoom in and out. So I'm zooming out right now. And you see it's given me a 5x5 five five graph paper just because I set 5 as my approximate size in the create part window just a moment ago. 
I'm going to zoom back in on this and we're going to start modeling our barbell. Now one thing I should point out, when we double clicked on parts, got the create part window and then hit continue and it brought us into this interface, it also changed this toolbar you see on the left over here. You see, depending on which module you are, this toolbar changes accordingly, giving you the tools you need in that module. And also up here, Abacus tells you what module you're in. Although you could just look at your tree over here and it basically reflects the same information. We're not going to look at each and every one of these tools in this video. In fact, we may not look at all of them in the entire set of tutorials. Some of them you can probably figure out just by clicking on them, playing around with them, and if you have experience with CAD, you'll pick this up pretty quickly. So we're only going to use the ones we need for the simulation, and hopefully that'll get you started. So the first one I'm going to click is the Create Lines Connected tool. I click on that, and I'm going to start out at the origin, and I'm going to draw up a basic sketch, kind of rough without dimensioning at first, outline of my barbell stand. You see, I just keep clicking and moving around. like that. And when I do the last click, Abacus sort of detects that I'm closing in on myself and it helps me complete the loop to create a closed sketch. Because remember, you always need a closed sketch in order to do an extrusion. Next, we're going to apply some constraints to this. Well, you'll notice Abacus has already gone ahead and put in some constraints. See, H stands for horizontal and V for vertical. And Abacus sort of detected that when we were drawing that, hey, you're trying to create a vertical line, so I'm just going to go ahead and put a V next to it and apply that constraint for you. But there's others that Abacus uh, doesn't pick up on its own. For example, we want this vertical segment to be the same length as this one. So what I'm going to do is go to the constraints tool and I'm going to click on add constraint. Now constraint we want is the equal length constraint so I click on that and Abacus tells me down here select the lines for the equal length constraint. So I come over and I click on the first segment, then I hold down the shift key on my keyboard, and I click on the second segment. And you see both of them have been lighted up in red as I did that. you got to hold down the shift key when you're selecting more than one uh, segment. And then I come over here and click done. And now you see Abacus has added that tiny little line there that sort of tells me these are equal length. So I don't want to add any more constraints right now. I'm just going to go ahead and close this Add Constraints window. And the next tool we're going to use is the Add Dimension tool, which is over here. I click on that. Abacus tells me to select the entity to dimension. So I guess we can start by dimensioning the overall height of the barbell stand. So we want to measure from up here to down here. So I'm going to click on that. And Abacus's initial reaction is to assume I'm trying to measure the horizontal length of the segment. But if, if I start moving upwards like this, and I move my mouse over the second segment, it realizes I'm trying to actually find the distance between those two segments. I click again, I drag it out, and click a third time. Now at the bottom of my screen, I can enter in the actual dimension itself. So we're going to go with 1.5. 
Now you see our dimensions were kind of off. Like my sketch was not very accurate at all. And it seems to have made a little bit of a mess over here. And maybe I should have started out with dimensioning some of the other parts first. So I'm going to backtrack just a little bit by undoing my previous option. You can do this by going to the edit menu and choosing undo or you could hit control Z on your keyboard. I'm going to undo this so we are back to where we were a step ago. I'm going to come back to the add dimension tool and this time I'm going to dimension the thickness of this this protrusion and I click on the first one and then the second pull it out click again and I'm gonna set this to point one I'm gonna go ahead and dimension the rest of this object Notice when I change this segment to 0 0.1, it also changed this segment over here because we've constrained them to be of equal length. So we've got our sketch dimensioned out exactly as it is in the schematic. It looks kind of small over here. So what we can do is go up here and click on the auto fit view button. And when I click that, it sort of fits it to my screen so you can see it a little bit better. And now that we're done dimensioning everything, we're going to hit the red cross over here to cancel the procedure and where it says sketch the sections for the solid extrusion well we've completed sketching it so we're gonna click on done this brings us to the edit base extrusion window now we've created the base itself which is the sketch and now abacus is asking us what depth to give the sketch in order to create the three-dimensional object so I'm gonna tell it to go with 0 0.1 again as for our schematic and I will click OK and there you see Abacus has drawn out our part file or our part. One thing I should probably mention which I hadn't mentioned before is Abacus doesn't ask you what set of units you're working with. If you noticed in the sketcher in the previous window we specified numbers like 0 0.1 and 0 0.4. Now what was the meaning of all this? Was Were we working in meters or inches or centimeters? You know what? Abacus says go ahead and work in whatever system of units you like. Just be sure to remain consistent. So for example, let's say I want to work in SI units. All of the lengths I specify should be in meters. All of the masses could be in kilograms, time and seconds. And so if I specify a constant such as the Young's modulus a little later on, I want to make sure I put that in pascals and not in gigapascals or megapascals. Because Abacus isn't really keeping track of the units, it's assuming you are. So you need to know what units you're working in 
and you need to make sure they remain consistent. And as long as you do that, you don't have to tell Abacus, hey, I'm working with meters or inches or kilograms or pounds. Abacus doesn't care about that. And if you want to better view this part, you can come up to the menu up here and click on Rotate View. And once you've clicked on that, you can drag in your viewport and view the part file from different angles to so make sure you've got it drawn out all correctly. And if it's a little too small or too big on your screen, you can hit the Auto Fit View key again and it sets it just about right on your screen. Now one thing we forgot to do, which you see in the schematic, is that these edges here are rounded. And so are the edges inside of this U-shaped loop over here. So what we should have done is, when sketching out the part, rounded these edges and then extruded that. Now there's two ways to fix this. Well, you're in the rotate view, so I want to first get you out of that. You can do that by clicking on the rotate view tool again, and now you've got your mouse pointer back. What we're going to do with one of these edges is uh, make the change in the sketch again. So we're going to go back to the parts container, expand that out, expand out barbell stand, going to go down to the features, solid extrude, and there you see the section sketch. And I'm going to right click on that and say edit. And this brings me back to the sketcher that we were in before. And now I'm going to create a fillet back here by going over to the create fillet between two curves tool. I click on that it asked me for a fillet radius. 0 0.05 meters is what I was aiming for. So I'm just going to hit enter on my keyboard. It says select the first entity near the end to be filleted. So I select my first entity and then it says select the second entity. So I go ahead and I select that. And there you see Abacus has created a fillet. If I zoom in on it, you can see it better. You still see this gray region outside because we haven't updated our previous view yet. So once again, I'm going to cancel out of this procedure now that it's done and hit the Done button. Now you see Abacus complains the feature has not yet been regenerated. You still see it without the fillet. But to regenerate it, you select Feature and then say Regenerate. So I'm going to say OK to that, come back here, and right click on Features and click on Regenerate. And there you see it has been regenerated and we've got our fillet. Another way to create the fillet would have been to do it right out over here without going into the Sketcher module. And we can do that by using the Create Round or Fillet tool. I'm going to click on that. And I'm going to choose Create Round or Fillet. Oh, it looks like I clicked on it twice, so I'm going to do it again. Now it says select the edges to round or fill it individually, or you could do it by edge angle. I'm going to go with individually, and if I zoom in a little closer, as I hover my mouse over the edges, Abacus lights them up. So I'm going to click on that edge and click on the done key. I'm going to set the radius to 0 0.02 which is what I want. Now Abacus isn't just correctly guessing these radii. I could previously guess 0 0.05 and 0 0.02 when that's exactly what I wanted to do. It's not that Abacus has some built-in logic, it's just that I've performed the simulation once before so my numbers are still sort of saved inside of Abacus. I'm going to hit the Enter key and there you see our fillet has been created. I also want to fillet around the other edge. 
So I'm going to rotate the model using the rotate view tool. Come back in here, click and rotate. I'm going to get back out of the rotate tool. And once again, select the create round or fillet tool. But since it's already selected, I'm not going to click on it again. Abacus is already ready, and so I select the edges to round or fill it. Once again, I click on the edge, I click done, I specify the radius, hit enter on my keyboard, and there you have it. And I'm going to hit the auto fit view button, and now you can see it a little better. And I'm going to use the rotate tool to rotate around, make sure everything's looking all right. So we've completed the creation of our part file. If you look in features, you see we have a solid extrude, and then we have two rounds, which you see light up here in the viewport as I click on them. You see these next to solid extrude, because all three of these things were done in the part modeler. You don't see this round show up, because that was done within the sketcher. So if I clicked on solid extrude, and went into the section sketch, then I'd be able to see that. It's just how Abacus arranges things. It's very systematic, but everything you've done is visible here in the models tree. So I'm gonna collapse these items just so we can see the rest of the model tree more clearly. And we are gonna move on to the next module which is creating materials. I'm going to double click on materials and it gives me the edit material window. The materials interface is where you create your material and define its properties. We're going to call our material steel. So we'll type in steel for the name you can put in a description if you want, but it's not required. And inside the material behaviors, Abacus gives you a whole list of options in these different menus. So in general, you could set the density, you could set the mechanical properties such as elasticity, plasticity, uh, ductility, and so on. And depending on the simulation, you're performing depending what you need. So if you were maybe doing a heat transfer analysis, you might want to put in information such as the conductivity. You are not required to fill out every single one of these for all the materials. In fact, you only fill out what you absolutely need, and that's good enough for Abacus. Now remember once again that all of your units need to be consistent. So I'm going to go into General and click on Density. And for Steel, I'm going to define the density as 7800 kilograms per meter cube. Remember, I only put in 7800, but I know my units are kilograms per meter cube because I use units of length in all of my dimensioning tasks when creating the part model. So once again, you need to keep your units in mind when you're keying in numbers. If you were to put this in grams per centimeter cube, your simulation just wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. You would get completely wrong numbers due to unit errors. I'm going to go into mechanical, elasticity, set it to elastic. And here I need to key in the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio. A Poisson's ratio for steel is about 0 0.3. I'm going to go ahead, type that in. And the Young's modulus is about 200 gigapascals. But remember, I can't put it in gigapascals. I need it to be in pascals now because I need to keep track of the units. So I'm going to key in two, 200 E9. So that's 200 gigapascals. I'm not going to worry too much about the other options over here. And I'm not going to put in any thermal properties or acoustic properties, or any of that other stuff, because this is what I need for the simulation. And I'm going to click on OK now. 
if you look in our model tree the material object now has a material steel within it and you can always right click on that and say edit and it'll take you back to this window so I'm gonna close this window and that's if you wanted to change the material properties you could of course create more than one material because your part might be created of different materials it doesn't necessarily have to be all steel or all one material and to do that you would just double click on materials and you create your second material and when you hit OK it would appear below steel in this materials tree the next module we're gonna look at is the sections module I'm gonna double click on sections and here you see the create section window now you see every part that you create can be made up of different sections so parts of your part could be treated as a solid others as a shell or a beam and also different parts can have different materials so what you do is you create different sections you assign the correct properties to those sections and then you assign those sections to different regions of your part so basically if I were to just partition out this arm over here and assign it a separate section from the rest of the body I could have two different materials in this part and I could be treating one of them as a solid the other as a shell and so on and so forth in our case we're just gonna have one big section for the entire thing so I'm gonna name it barbell stand section now I know that's not very creative but this is only for demonstration purposes once you learn to use abacus you can do all sorts of creative things like renaming all these and of course performing more complex analyses so the category I'm gonna choose solid and for the type I'm gonna go with homogeneous and I click on continue next it asks me what material is the section gonna have now since I've created one material it's already populated this list over here with that one material if we created four or five they'd all be over here and if maybe we don't want to use any of these we click on the create button and it brings back the create material window which you saw in the material module and allows you to create a new one I'm gonna hit the OK button so now we've defined our section you see it in the section object the barbell section what we need to do now is assign this section to our part so we go back up to the parts container now this is one of those times when you're actually moving back up to a place you've already crossed in the model tree usually you just go top down filling out each thing depending on what you need but this time we gotta go back up expand out the barbell stand and you see section assignments listed over here we're gonna double click on that abacus says select the regions to be assigned a section we essentially want to select this entire part so I'm gonna zoom out using the scroll wheel of my mouse just so we can see the whole thing and as I hover my mouse over it you see the part object light up it's in fact lighting up the entire part because we haven't partitioned this part and we'll get to partitioning later abacus is only able to select separate partitions or an entire part file so in this case it's gonna try to select the entire part and we're okay with that I'm gonna click on it and then we're gonna say done and it gives us the edit section assignment window so the section we want is barbell section which is the one we just defined and it's telling us this is solid homogeneous it's steel which is all the information we provided it and we're gonna click on OK and now you see we do have a section assignment it's the barbell stand section 
and Abacus has also gone ahead and changed the color here in the viewport just to let you know hey this part's been assigned the section you're good to go once again I'm gonna collapse these items just so that it's easier to see the rest of the tree we're not gonna work with profiles in this video although we will look at it in future tutorials a profile is helpful if maybe you're creating a beam such as iBeam so you can specify the iBeam profile in this in fact I'll go ahead and click on it just so you know what I'm talking about see the create profile window you could be going with say an iBeam or a T or an L and if I were to go with I and click continue I could specify the dimensions of the beam but we're gonna cancel out of that because that's not part of the simulation the next step is assembling now let's go over to the assembly module if you noticed I referred to these previous modes as modules I call them the materials module, the sections module, the profiles module maybe module isn't the technically correct word these are more like different modes within a module if you want to know the modules you click up here in the module menu and you see part now, parts is in the part module whereas materials sections and profiles are all in the property module so I sometimes use these names interchangeably so you should be aware of that it's not a big deal you can go ahead and call it what you want but we're gonna go into assembly by double clicking on it and now we are in the assembly view it's blanked out the viewport because in the assembly view we have not yet imported any parts so the assembly itself is blank even though we have parts that can be imported every time you run a simulation in abacus you need to create an assembly uh, this sort of makes more sense when you have more than one part because then you can assemble them together position them correctly apply the correct set of constraints but in our case we only have the one part so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense but that's just the way it works even if we have only one part we gotta create an assembly with that one part if we expand out the assembly container we see instances, position constraints, features, sets, surfaces, etc and you'll learn more about uh, things like sets in later uh, tutorial videos in this one we're only going to go with instances we don't need any posi position constraints because we're only importing one object so we're not going to be positioning other parts with respect to that one I'm going to double click on instances gives me the create instance window and it fills out the parts in this list over here we only have the one and it's showing me a preview of what that would look like in the assembly window the only real option here is to choose whether you want your instance to be dependent which means you mesh the part or independent which means you mesh the instance and we're gonna take a deeper look at meshing in later videos in this one we're gonna go with dependent which means when we create the mesh later we're gonna be creating it in here in the part itself as opposed to creating the mesh in the assembly this has advantages and disadvantages and we'll talk about those later but just so you know you cannot have a mesh on a part and import that in and then import another instance of that part and mesh it in the assembly you either choose one or the other and this time we're gonna go with mesh on the part I'm gonna click on OK and there you see our part has been instanced into the assembly and it's also listed here in the instances tree if you look in features you see it's created a coordinate system with it but we're not gonna worry too much about that in this tutorial video I'm going to collapse the assembly 
and we're going to move on to the next item which is steps. Every simulation of Abacus is carried out in a series of steps. You have an initial step where you could possibly set up a few things uh, such as maybe set your boundary conditions or maybe just not set anything at all in that initial step. And then you can have a second step where maybe you apply a load on a certain part. And maybe a third step where you assign another load or some other behavioral property. <laughs> and Abacus will execute all of these steps one after another as different time steps within the simulation. In our example, we're only going to need two steps. The first is the initial step, which every Abacus simulation must have. And the second step is going to be a loading step, where we apply the loads. We're going to apply the boundary conditions in the initial step, but this is more a matter of preference. Sometimes you can assign it in the load step, and it'll work out just fine. But other times you have more complex simulations where you want to make sure you're applying different boundary conditions at different stages of the simulation. And in that case, you want to think about where you're applying loads and boundary conditions, which steps, and create the steps accordingly. But you'll understand that better as you uh, get deeper into Abacus and more familiar with the whole environment. I'm going to expand out steps. And as you see, Abacus has already gone ahead and placed an initial step in place. I'm going to double click on steps and it gives me a create step window. And I'm going to call the step the loading step. And I'm going to tell Abacus to insert this new step after the initial step. The procedure type in our case is going to be a, a general procedure. And from all of the options listed over here, we're going with static general. Because that's what we're doing in the simulation. We're not doing a heat transfer. We're not doing an explicit analysis or a dynamic analysis or any of these others. Ours is a very simple static general analysis. I'm going to click on continue after that. Uh, the edit step window gives you a few more options. You might want to go ahead and type out a description over here. You do fill out the description field in larger, more complex simulations just to keep track of what you're doing. So when you come back here later, you can read that. And it'll hopefully make more sense if you've forgotten what you were thinking at the time. I'm going to leave all of the other properties intact in the basic tab and the incrementation tab and the other tab. See, we don't want to worry too much about all of these properties in this beginner tutorial. The only one I'm going to point out is the time period. That tells Abacus how much time it needs to spend performing this step. So your initial could be one time step and then your loading could be a second time step and then on a third one you have maybe another load or whatever else you want to do in your third step. I'm gonna go ahead and click OK and there you see we've created a loading step so now we've got initial and loading and they're both marked over there. Next, we're going to click on Field Output Requests. You see two items over here, Field Output Request and History Output Request. Now, this can be a little confusing for beginners, so let me explain what the difference between these two is. A Field Output Request is basically the set of data that Abacus should gather from all parts of your model or all parts of your part file. Let's say you want to know the stress distribution over the entire part. So every X number of steps, or maybe every time step, Abacus is going to record the stress at every point, at every node in this model, and store it in your output file. So basically a field output request 
applies to a very large region or to the entire part. Also, Abacus doesn't store this data very frequently because otherwise your output would get very large. So field outputs are variables that have been stored over large regions at not too frequent intervals in the simulation. History output, on the other hand, is the complete opposite. Let's say you want to know the displacement of this little node up here over the time of the simulation. You would use a history output request for that. Basically, history output requests focus on very tiny regions, and Abacus stores that data with a higher frequency. So you might be interested in seeing exactly how this point moves as a load is applied on the barbell stand. So it's basically a difference in thinking, a different approach. The field output requests sort of gather information on the entire part at not so frequent intervals, whereas the history output requests focus in or zero in on one tiny little point or part and record the information a lot more frequently. So maybe later you can plot displacement versus time or something like that. We're gonna go ahead and expand out the field output requests. You see Abacus by default creates a field output request and you can right click on that, delete it, and then create a new one by double clicking on field output requests and you see it's calling it F output 2. Or we could just modify the one that's already there by right clicking on it and saying edit. And by default Abacus selects a few variables that it thinks are useful in all simulations. So you see you've got pre-selected defaults uh, selected over here. Whereas if you wanted to select your own set of variables, you'd click on select from list below and then choose the ones you want. The pre-selected defaults are a few key ones like stresses and displacements, which is what we're going to use when we look at the deformed shape of the object once we've run the analysis. And there's a host of others. You could go through this. They've got very descriptive names, so you can check off the ones you need. In addition, for the domain, it's been set to the whole domain, which is pretty good for a field output. Usually in a history output, you might be going for a set, but in field outputs, I like to go with the whole model just because it gives me all the information I need for post-processing later. In terms of frequency, it's been set to every n increments. So every at every increment in your analysis, Abacus is going to store this information in the output file. You could tell it to just store it at the last increment or at evenly spaced time intervals or from time points, which you would define over here in the time points mode or module. But we're not going to do that in this simulation. We're going to leave it at every n increments. And keep in mind, some of these options, such as every x units of time, are more applicable to an explicit analysis, not a static or standard analysis. So Abacus may not allow you to select some of these, even if you tried. We're going to go ahead and click on OK. And so we've got our field outputs defined. As for history outputs, it's a similar procedure. I'm going to open it up, and you see it's got a few pre-selected defaults. And you can change those if you want. And you can change the domain, you can change the frequency. We're just going to leave it as it is for now, for this simulation. And click on OK. I'm going to skip over a bunch of these modules you see over here. We don't have any interactions going on in this simulation. We don't have contact, although theoretically we've got a barbell contacting this barbell stand. But in our simulation, we're just applying a force over here instead of placing a barbell on top of it. So we don't need contact either. And we don't have any fields or amplitudes. We're going to create our load as a pressure as opposed to an amplitude. If maybe 
you had an explosion going off and you were creating a finite element simulation for armor plating or a blast resistant panel, then you might want to go in with amplitudes because uh, in an explosion, you know, the force generated changes with time, so you've got a sort of wave, and then you could use the amplitude uh, module to create that force. We're going to go with simple loads. So I'm going to double click on loads, and it gives me the create load window. Here I'm going to name it load from barbell. Now the step I want it to be applied in is the loading step. If you recall, we have an initial step and a loading step. So we do not want this load applied right at the start of the simulation. We want the simulation to get ready and then apply it in the loading step. For the category, we're going to go with mechanical. You see, it's, it's not even going to let us choose some of these other options. We just haven't defined enough properties in the simulation yet. And in the mechanical category, we want to go with a pressure load. We could go with concentrated force, but then you'd be applying it at a specific point. Whereas we want to apply it over this entire face in the U-shaped holder. So that's why I'm going with a pressure. Now, of course, you make different assumptions when you're running your simulations. You decide whether you want to model your force as a pressure or a constant force or a shell edge load. And this is going to change from simulation to simulation. But in this one, we're going to go with pressure because it makes the most sense. We click on continue. And Abacus says select the surfaces for the load. Now you can select them individually or by angle. We're going to go with individually. Also, if you had defined surfaces earlier, such as in the assembly module, if you expand that out, you see sets and surfaces. In assembly, we could have given some of these surfaces names, identified them and named them. And now in the loads module, once we're back in, oh, it kicked me out for a second. So let me just fill this back up here. Once you're in the loads, it would give me the option of clicking here on surfaces and then picking out those surfaces that we'd identified in the assembly module. Since we haven't done that, we're going to pick out the surfaces right here within the loads module. And so I'm going to say select the surfaces individually. I'm going to click on that surface and then I click on done. So we selected the surface. Now Abacus wants to know what kind of load I want to put on it. So for the magnitude, I'm going to say 400. Now I'm assuming this is an 80 kilogram barbell. So each barbell stand needs to hold the weight of 40 kilograms. And you know, kilograms is a unit of mass. We want force. So I'm multiplying it by 9.8 or, well, I'm multiplying it by 10 just to make the calculation easier, and I'm making that 400. So that's 400 newtons of force that we're applying. And as for the amplitude we spoke about over here, we haven't created one, so we're going to leave that at the default, and we're going to leave the distribution at uniform as well. And I click on OK, and you see Abacus has created little arrows over there showing me that a force is being applied on the surface. I could zoom in a little closer for you and there you see them. So now we've defined the load. The next step is to define the boundary conditions. So I come over here to boundary conditions. I double click on that and I'm going to name it fixed to ground. That's because our barbell stand is going to be placed on the ground, maybe even locked in there. So we want to tell Abacus that, hey, this lower part 
of the barbell stand, that's fixed. So don't move this. It's not falling through the sky or anything. It's fixed to the ground. So it's only this top section here that's really free to move. As for the step, I could leave it a loading step, but I prefer to change it to initial. I like applying my boundary conditions before the loads are applied. And that might be a matter of personal preference, but I found this works pretty well when you've got a lot of boundary conditions and a lot of steps. It can get pretty confusing later on. So I'm going to set it to initial. The category is mechanical. As for the constraint itself, I'm going to go with incaster. Incaster is when you fix something so it has zero degrees of freedom. It cannot translate an X, Y, or Z, nor can it rotate about any of those. In different simulations, you might choose different ones over here, uh, depending on your needs. So I'm going to go with symmetry, anti-symmetry, and caster. Click on it. Click on continue, sorry. And then Abacus says, select the regions for the boundary condition. I want to select the region at the bottom. So what I'm going to do is rotate this around by using the rotate view tool. Come back here, rotate it around. Click on the tool again, so I return back to what Abacus wanted, and I can click on it now. And then I click on Done. But before I click Done, let me just explain. You see the Sets button here? Now if in the assembly, and I'm not going to click on it because then I'll have to redo these steps, but if in assembly you had defined Sets, then you can just click on Sets and select the set instead of choosing it over here in this viewport. I'm going to click on Done, and next it's asking me to be more specific. Am I going for symmetry condition? Am I trying to pin it? Or am I trying to like fix it completely? So I'm going to go with Incaster, which means the translations as well as the rotations are all zero. And then I click OK. And there you see Abacus has marked the boundary conditions on it. I'm going to rotate it around. And so you can see the entire bottom has been fixed in place. The next step is to mesh the part. Now if you recall, when we imported the instances into the assembly, it asked us if we wanted it to be dependent or independent. And we chose dependent which means the mesh has to be created on the part file itself. So we're going to go up to parts over here, expand it out, expand out our barbell stand, and the mesh object over here, you notice it's empty because we haven't created a mesh yet. So I'm going to double click on it, and that brings me into the mesh module. You see over here it says module mesh. So we've essentially run through all of these by using the tree on the left. Some people prefer to navigate through the interface using this drop-down instead, but I prefer going down the tree. You can see what works better for you and decide accordingly. Uh, for a mesh, the first thing we want to do is create the elements. So we're going to say mesh element type, and this is where we tell Abacus what kind of elements we want to use. I'm going to go with the standard library, because this is a standard analysis, not an explicit. And I'm going to go with linear and leave it at hex. Now meshing can be a little complicated. Generally it requires some level of knowledge of finite element analysis itself to understand what types of meshes are better for different activities. But we're going to have a video dedicated to just that later on in this tutorial series. For now, Let's just go with a mesh that I've already worked with and I've got decent results with it. I'm going to say the geometric order is linear and I'm going to click OK. Next you want to seed the part. Seeding the part is where you essentially tell Abacus how small you want to make each of the cells. So you go to seed part. 
You could individually see the edges if you wanted to, but we're just going to go with the entire part here. I'm going to set the approximate global size to 0 0.05 meters. I'm going to leave everything else at the default and click OK. And there you see the seeds have been marked out on the part itself. And you can see they're 0 0.05 meters apart because that's what I specified. And then finally you go to mesh and you tell it to actually go ahead and mesh the object. But before that, I want to click on done just to let Abacus know seeding was complete. I'm going to go back to mesh and say part and Abacus asks me is it okay to mesh the part. I'm going to say yes. And there you see Abacus has gone ahead and meshed the part for me. Our next task is to create the job itself. I'm going to scroll down to the analysis tree. And analysis, you see a jobs container. I'm going to double click on that jobs container. And it changes us to the job module. I'm going to name our job loaded barbell stand. The source is the model, not an input file. Input files are different. When you're working in Abacus CAE, you've got this whole interface to help you out. But sometimes in research, and even before this whole pre-processing environment was created for Abacus, you would have to use input files where you type out your instructions as opposed to generating them by clicking around in this GUI interface. I'm going to click on continue and I see the edit job window. You can give it a description and there's a lot of options here. You can set in like memory requirements and a parallelization and stuff like that to help you run your simulation Maybe your computer is crashing, just doesn't have enough memory, and you could make some changes in the memory tab. Mostly, we're just going to look at the submission tab right here. And I'm going to tell it to go ahead and do a full analysis for the simulation. You do have some other options, such as, for example, a restart job. And this would be if you've already gathered some data using a previous analysis, and you want to restart the analysis from that point using that data. But in our case, we're just going to go with a simple full analysis and click the OK button. And now you see in the jobs container, we have a job created for us. In order to run it, we're going to right click on it and we're going to say submit. If we said data check, Abacus would try to check through our data and tell us if it thinks the simulation is going to run successfully or not. Maybe it might detect problems with your meshing. In fact, when you hit the submit button, it does initially do the data check and then move on to the simulation. But sometimes if you've got really big simulations that go on for hours, you might want to do a data check first before hitting submit. In our case, we're just going to go ahead and hit the submit button. And you see, it says submitted over here in parentheses. And at the bottom of, of your window, you see Abacus talking about what it's doing at the moment. And now it says it's running. So it was submitted, it went through the input file processor, and then it successfully completed running a standard analysis. And you see here it says completed in parentheses. Now, once it's been completed, we can right click on it and say results. And now what you're looking at is the results module. And the tree over here is the results tree, as opposed to previously you were looking at the model tree. And the results tree, you can basically visualize the results of your analysis and also deal with other options such as exporting your output files, generating a few plots and exporting them. And we're just going to look at 
a few basic things right now. First thing you see is your meshed object. If you want to see how it would have deformed, or the results of the simulation, how they say it's deformed, you come over here and click on the plot deform shape. And you see Abacus displays a deformed shape of your barbell stand. And I can use the rotate view command to move around and look at that better. Of course, this is highly exaggerated. Your barbell stand, you would not want it to deform so much. If I click back and forth between these, you see that's a lot of deformation. And there's no way steel has deformed that much with a 40 kilogram load. So Abacus has gone ahead and you know, multiplied your deformation by a factor just to help you visualize things better. But there is a way to change that, and we'll cover that in another tutorial. Another thing I want you to look at is the deform shape. You want to plot contours on the deform shape. You click on the Plot Contours button, and there you see it's plotted the mysis stress on the barbell stand itself. And here you see a key telling you what the colors stand for. So you can see where your stress concentrations are. You seem to have the most right here along this front face and a little less on the back. Because our force was not directly above the vertical column. So this is not purely a, a tensile or a compressive problem. You've also got bending going on. And that's why you've got higher stresses down here, lower ones out there. And you've got some stresses here at the base where the column connects with the base itself. And so we've run through a basic simulation of Abacus. We've modeled the barbell stand. We've created materials assign properties, loads, boundary conditions. We've seen how to assemble stuff. We've created steps, and we've created a job. We've meshed the part, and we've run the analysis. So we've done a whole bunch of stuff in this set of tutorial videos. It's not a very complex analysis. Every analysis you perform in Abacus requires the due diligence. You need to go through the process. It's not a two-minute job you need to make sure you're putting in all the right properties, all the right parameters, and only then will you have a successful simulation. In some simulation software, such as in Cosmos Works with SolidWorks, it might seem a whole lot simpler at first because you just don't have the level of detail and control that you do in Abacus, but you got to remember Abacus is basically a research tool. That's how it originated, and so it's got the power and complexity associated with that. The complexity, of course, might be a downside for a beginner, but once you get good at it, you can really perform pretty much any type of simulation you're looking for. And I hope this initial set of introduction uh, tutorial videos has got you acclimatized to the Abacus environment. You've got a general feel for how you perform a simulation in this environment, and you understand like all the basic steps that go into it. In future videos, we're going to look or focus more closely on smaller details. Like we might look more closely at different types of loads or boundary conditions or creating sets, surfaces, etc. And if you've understood everything in this tutorial video, you're ready to move on to more complex simulations. So stick around, we'll see you in the next Abacus video.